Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. I appreciate it. It's virtual, so um, it's a little bit different this time. I'm sorry I can't see all of you, and but at least you can see me and see my slides. So let's uh, get to it. Um, my my uh, talk today is community transformation uh, enables scale long running through data 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 driven initiatives, and uh, it is a work in progress. We've not finished this pro initiative. Um, it's, um, it's a very complex initiative, and so uh, I'm going to give you an update on where we are, where we want to go, and um, how things are going so far, all right? So let me, let's start with who am I? Um, my name is Sri Ram Ram Krishna. My friends call me Sri, and, uh, the reason, and um, I work for a company called IT Renew. We do something called Circular Data Center. Um, or, and um, so my job is a principal ecosystems engineer. And um, although this talk is about community, so uh, I've spent most of my uh, open source or free software experience working uh, in community and uh, especially with the GNOME project. Uh, if you're not familiar with the GNOME project, it is a, um, a your hardware, your human interface to your hardware. So it's a desktop. And so uh, I've spent over 20 years in this project. And so um, it's it's one of my pleasures, uh, guilty pleasures of being able to do this, but I'm thrilled to be able to work in open source and free software and also be able to do this. So big thanks to my employer who lets me spend time on this. Uh, so anyway, um, moving on. Um, Again, 25 years experience. So when I came up with this initiative, um, you know, a lot of, it, it's probably no surprise to most uh, community projects or even corporate projects that projects want to grow. And a lot of times projects um, usually have a drumbeat. They, they, a lot of times they want resources. They want maybe IT resources. Maybe they want um, uh, developers and, and so forth. So, but a lot of times I've noticed while spending my years in the GNOME project, which is a fairly complex project, that what people want and or complain about is not always the truth, right? So when people say they want developers, is it, do they really want developers? Is that really what they want? Because adding developers means a whole kind of starts a chain reaction of things because you have to onboard them. You've got to train them. You've got, uh, you've got to integrate them into the project. And so a lot of those things come into play and now you're dealing with an incredible amount of complex overhead. And, and a lot of times when people say they want these things, it's in addition to many other things they may want. So, and if you onboard just devs or just maybe the wrong skill sets, you're gonna start seeing like this Django board where you're getting stresses somewhere else, right? And it's, it's, uh, it's really an interesting observation going through the years of watching people do this. And, and we know this a lot. I mean, it's like if any of you listened or, or read Mythical Man Month, you, you know that adding more developers to a project does not make the project go faster or runs more and more efficiently, right? It's, it's simply a, a, it just adds complexity because there's so much more overhead that's generated. So this initiative is really about how do we build teams correctly using data to, to drive that, right? So, so in, in the, in, for, the, for the GNOME project, this is a great example of trying to be able to see if we can do something with an initiative like this and see if it works or, or uh, and see if it um, does what we intend to, right? And GNOME is a, is, a, is a great test project because it has, it is a, it's a very large project. It's was started in, in 1998, it has, uh, it has gone through many series of changes and being it's evolved over time. Uh, we started with rudimentary tools and then 
uh, as the project grew, it grew into multiple teams where before you had just this one mass of developers and that's it. Now, as we go for going forward, they're split it into many different kinds of teams. So you have teams that are doing engineering, uh, they have teams that are doing mar uh, marketing or an, and uh, engagement, people who do translation, there are, pe there, are, there are people who do documentation, there's a release team, there's an IT team. And if you start looking at it, it starts looking like a, uh, like a product, a product team. And with so many different moving parts and a, a wide set of skills across the board, um, it is the perfect initiative to see how can we scale a project? Um, and so this, this, is, this is where the scalable onboarding comes in. Um, and please don't look at that misspelling on scalable. <laughs> so, so then I, I've given all those things. And then the question is, is what then is what? And you can't really answer this question without data, right? And as I commented before, growth does not mean adding developers to a project. And so you need to be strategic. And where that is depends on what each team is. And each team is different in the way they go about doing development. Uh, some people are doing development, some people are doing non-programming skill sets. Uh, each of them have a particular way of doing things. And so how do you get that data? And, and you start with what resources you have right now. So think about that for a moment. You had a large team. How do you get information? Where, where is the beginning part of researching how you grow a team? And I had, uh, so when I started this, it's, it's sort of like, okay, how, where is, where do I start with this? Where, where is the and thing? And it, it occurred to me that I don't really understand from a high level how GNOME works like at a 1,000 foot level, how does GNOME operate? And what are, what are the roles? What are the, uh, what are the descriptions of those roles? What, um, how do people interact? And, and with that really understanding your project and how it manages its resources, um, it's really hard to, to set a level playing field on how this works. So, Let's see. So what should we do? And so let's start with roles and, descri and description. So GNOME is a full stack free and open source project. And one of the things we did was break down all the volunteers and what they do. And that happens in many different ways, right? So um, I already told you we had engineering teams, we have documentation team and things like that. And from a high level, we're, we're breaking it down at, uh, I don't know, um, the complexity of those teams are very interesting, especially at the engineering level. So, but somewhat repetitive. If you look at the engineering teams, you have a set of core, core engineering things, right? So there's a stack. And so each stack has a maintainer and a, and a set of contributors. So you have those and each of those maintainers have their own set of ways they're doing things. Then if you, that's, that's then. Then there's the release team. And, and then the release team has their own set of uh, things that they get from, uh, 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 they basically decide what is GNOME? What is the product? What do you release? Then you have the marketing team 
and they're subdivided into many different kinds of roles. Um, and since that's kind of uh, where I come from, uh, you can imagine that a marketing team has uh, people who know how to do storytelling, people who understand social media, people who understand um, uh, uh, onboarding, right? Uh, or uh, socializing or all of these things. There's even a code of conduct. That's part of, part of that. And so there's all these various teams and their roles that uh, you have to document. And once you have them documented, you start thinking about uh, what, uh, what they do, right? So in this case, I'm, I'm going through these slides. We have um, release engineering and all these various things. This is basically all I, I talked about before. So that's, that's, uh, that's the set of things that uh, we, we put together. So the next, the next step is the, uh, inter how do we as a team interact uh, as a project, right? So in this case, we, we decided to build an interaction map. And so we look at how these teams, and this is a very simplified version of what we put together because the, the real version is, is, it's got arrows flying all over the place. Um, it's, it's, literally chaos because there's some of that is uh, how they operate today. And uh, I, I think at some point I wanted to take what was operating today and think what should operate like in the future, right? That was sort of a, a, a want or a need that I wanted to do is how, how can I uh, make this, uh, uh, a future thing. So, but one of the interesting things if you look here is you have these arrows pointing there and you can kind of see some weaknesses, right? You see the, let's take a look at the engagement team and the engineering team. And you see that the, the engagement team is only a one directional arrow, right? Uh, it, in a, 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 I think a well-balanced project that should be bi-directional. Um, and so while, while we're going through this, this is the kind of things that you, uh, um, you, you look through them and it's like, oh, I see a weakness here. This is, this is not how things should be. We should, we should think about how those things work. And, um, and you can also see like the documentation. The documentation team actually, uh, is sort of an interesting team here because the documentation team is really only fixed on, not on the, this, like the, the, the stack, right? Uh, it's actually on like the help guide. So if you type, type an F1 on an app, it tells you how to use it, that kind of thing. The engineering team actually takes care of the documentation uh, for uh, the APIs and so forth. So, um, but they do rely on the engineering team to tell us, say, hey, what is the new features that is happening in this product so that we can update the documentation and, and so forth. But it's still a one directional arrow that, um, that uh, was surprising, right? Again, uh, this is how this thing is working. And you can see that, that there's a lot of time wasted just doing one directional um, of communication, which can, can do that. So when you're thinking about scalable, what, what do I need to make these arrows uh, bi-directional versus one-directional, right? What kind of skill sets is required and kind of thing. And so, so this, this actually, when we did it, it kind of surprised us in some ways on, wow, um, there, there's some problems here, right? So that, that was something I, I, uh, I thought was quite interesting. And, um, okay, so the other part we wanted to do was personas. Uh, personas has generally been used in marketing or product development or various other things, like who's going to use this project product. And in this case, we're using personas in who do you, I think our volunteers are and, um, and what will they be doing? 
who, what are their backgrounds, what, all of those kinds of things. And, um, and the reason we put that together is because personas is something that um, lets us get us into the minds of who is coming in to volunteer because part of onboarding is, is the strategic part of onboarding is who do we want? And so when we're trying to articulate a message and we want to uh, attract certain kinds of skill sets, we, we have sort of an idea like what would resonate? What kind of people are out there? And a lot of that is a reflection of the volunteers we have working today, uh, the volunteers we might meet at conferences or various other kinds of things. So it's, it's really quite, um, what should I say, uh, interesting to see what, who was out there and what their background was. Uh, some we made up just because it's, it's like, well, how would we talk to somebody who is a 50 year old systems administrator, but wants to get, wants to go into marketing, right? You know, and that way you kind of say, oh well, yeah, okay, a 50 year old systems administrator, which actually is me and um, is, uh, is, uh, interested in marketing is what would what would that skill set have what, what kind of skill set would they have what kind of things would they be using or um, what is their uh, experience level that kind of thing so these personas really help us to decide where would they where would they be where are they located so that so I, we found the idea of doing personas for for this to be quite um, uh, valuable and here's an example of the, the kind of volunteers we kind of get, right? So you, you see, uh, we have a, a new, uh, someone who's a new contributor. Uh, Jane here is a university student, skilled with Python and looking for an open source project to start making contributions to. Uh, she's 20 years old, she's from Nigeria. Um, and and, and, and uh, one thing we went afterwards was to say, what, problems did you have trying to get into open source or what, or even to you know, project. And so the, um, so it turns out, you know, like documentation, did lot, some of the documentation does not work. And so these are ways to strategically think like, okay, you know, there may be problems there. Uh, same thing, goals, but uh, they want to be, they want to join the GNOME project. They want to uh, be part of the GNOME community. Then we have Ruth, who is a graduate microbiologist. Now, not your uh, typical maybe open source developer, but you know, she but she's trying to change from being a microbiologist to a um, self learn into a um, uh, a developer. Actually, Ruth uh, uh, Ikaga is actually a uh, a real, a real, a real person, <laughs> and a real volunteer who helps out is actually on, on our team. There's a team. She's actually uh, been have been accepted in a number of talks and and so forth. So uh, her path is has been uh, quite fascinating to watch as, as she also gets into the open source world. Uh, and so she makes a really good persona. Of uh, what is what would be a typical you know, volunteer and what would be their background. So, so we have. Well, let's stop for a moment, and let's think about where we are right now. So, we've gone through about ten slides about what um, um, uh, what is a what is the working idea of your role of your organization um, so you have a working idea of how this project works you have a working idea how it interacts with others in fact there is an opportunity here to think how do they interact with other projects, right? So nothing says that you don't, you you can't look at it from a meta perspective, that uh, you can't not look at it from from that, right? In fact, uh, there's another initiative 
talking about an app ecosystem where we are doing a meta project, where we are looking at how we interact with each other as a overall uh, ecosystems of various degrees. And, and then we looked at what kind of projects or volunteers and your background. You know? So these are all pieces that of information that we can put down and, and, and refer to as building blocks uh, when we go through uh, the rest of the initiative, right? Because um, sometimes they're, they're maps, they're maps of information to, to refer to, to see where, where are things going on and where are the stress points, where are the various bits. So, but that's not, that's not all we're doing right now. Now, if you remember way back at the beginning of this talk, uh, I talked about how um, the, the, the project is a complex project with lots of different teams and every maintainer has um, their own idea of doing things. Now, from a social engineering point of view, how you know, how does, uh, uh, how do you convince a team to do that? Because um, if you're going to take on uh, and, and grow a team, uh, a lot of times that might mean adding people. It might mean doing documentation. It might mean changing how they manage their project. And, um, and so if, if you can't, uh, my point here is you can't do a top-down approach and say, this is the way we're going to do it. Uh, there's too, there's too many, open source doesn't work that way or free software does not work that way. It, it requires uh, uh, the ability to convince someone that this is the way to do it. This is, this is no different than how we do development. It, it, it's like we're seeing an MR and then convincing somebody or MR or a PR uh, and, and saying, well, you know, I want you to take, I want you to take this. Well, you're making this change, but you're, you, you, I mean, tell us how this will actually help us. And, uh, and to do that is you have to find a team that will actually be willing to, um, work with you because, they do want to grow their team, that they are in a position where they're exhausted, that they, in order to continue doing the work they're doing, they need more people and they're suffering burnout or various other things. Those are a great team to work with. Uh, I mean, it's one, it doesn't act initially have to be a team that is in, in dire straits, but um, that's one example. Another one is an upcoming team uh, um, that may be just starting out and wants to set the right foundation for growth. That's another kind of great team to work with. So, so that's, that's uh, a thing. So start with one team and then work them to be successful. And then you go and say, hey, listen, we have the metrics. We have the ability to show that we grow this team to a point where we can now they're working great and they're set for the future because we understand how this team grows and we want to do that for your team. So uh, this might seem familiar to a lot of you who are, who are in the corporate world. We have to do kind of similar things. And a lot of times if you're working with sister teams, we uh, a top-down approach doesn't always work, right? So, um, oops, sorry. So, um, I passed one. Okay. Uh, all right. So, who was the team we worked with? Uh, in Pino? And uh, in this team, this is not actually really a team, but it's actually a um, uh, the set of mentors. So, the mentors team are the people who uh, help with mentoring um, folks who are coming in. Um, in GSOC or Outreachy or things like that. Um, uh, these are internships that come in and we have to um, uh, 
build. Uh, they, they come in and then we've got to have to you know, do the onboarding with them. Now, unfortunately, it's been the same set of mentors that's been happening over and over and over again, right? And so now there's a sense of burnout because no new mentors are coming in to help expand and in a, in a equitable uh, scenario, um, some of the, the old mentees might come back to do mentors. So, so the, the thing is, if that's the case, why it has, why have we not scaled mentors to the point that we can have more folks? Because a lot of these mentors are also maintainers of projects. Uh, and so the combination of mentoring, the combination of, of maintaining a open source project and then work and life, uh, all of that ends up becoming quite a bit of problems. So, um, so this, this, is, this is what they came to us with and say, help us figure this out. <laughs> how, Help us figure out how we can grow our mentors because we're feeling beat up every year. And, and each year it's getting harder and harder to do these mentoring things. So with that in mind, uh, the idea would be to do a problem statement. And the problem statement uh, is works like this. And um, we define that Mentors are exhausted and burnt out. That's the problem statement. And they are dealing with problems where they're essentially repeating the same onboarding process over and over and over again. And this is sort of part of where we gather the data, right? So we, we look at what all is happening uh, in the time that uh, they're going through this. And so we started uh, by interviewing mentors and mentees. And, and for each of them, uh, we built a, a, um, uh, um, a problem, right? So we start off with the mentors. And so they, so for those who are curious of what are some of those problems, and maybe some of you who are mentors at Open, uh, on, on open source projects uh, in Outreach or GSOC, uh, you, you might have um, seen some of this. Uh, they've had problems with uh, language, uh, problems with um, misunderstanding uh, 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 things. Um, th there are problems with cultural backgrounds, what may constitutes a joke may not be a joke. And so there's all these things and that's just the cultural human interaction issues that actually happens regularly with just many types of people, but also um, onboarding them into GNOME projects. So a lot of them are the same set of questions that, that are being asked on a biannual basis, right? Why does this happen? Why does this happen? Why do we do this? And then, so you end up having to go through these cycles in Oregon and, and people get tired of answering the same questions over and over and over again. So it, it gets a little bit um, 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 taxing uh, when you're doing all of those things. So, um, then we went with the mentees, and, and so that's a different set of, of issues. A lot of them comes, a lot of that, like, they never feel like they're part of the project because they do not, uh, there's no socializing. So, like, um, men mentees are working in a vacuum. They have, they have the, almost like a fog of war, right? So you have, um, a, a, a group of uh, an intern working on a project and then they are they have their set of their mentors and then uh, a, a channel where they hang out in and and then that's it though but they're not they don't see the other mentees 
they don't see other people working on there. So they never get a, into a area where there's, there, there's camaraderie or any kind of things. So they don't actually feel part of the project. Right. So in fact, the only time they feel that way is actually when they, um, they come to the in-person conferences, uh, and actually meet the other, other, uh, um, um, interns. So, 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 so that's, uh, that's a interesting thing is that is that's the only time and then they, they kind of, then it all comes together. Now with these COVID times and the, the virtual, that's much harder now. So how do you build, build, uh, build a rapport? And so these are the kind of problem statements that are going through that we record one after another and, and call it all these responses. So once you have that, and, and this, is, this is sort of where um, we're still at that previous stage where we're getting all this. Now, unfortunately, when, when you're dealing with a group of people who are already resource uh, uh, limited, they also don't have as much time to talk to you either, <laughs> right? So, so um, the, the process tends to go a little slowly because uh, we have to we have to go at the speed that they can handle uh, to do it. So, uh, uh, so from here, um, it, it's a it's more of a projection of what should happen, um, and so I'm, I'm heading in, in that direction. So, uh, at this point, we build a project plan, and and I take a lot of how we did this from the chaos project. So we, uh, I'm involved in a chaos project uh, working group and, uh, and actually uh, Georg Link, uh, who I work with is giving a talk at the same, same time slot. So if you've seen mine and you should definitely go and see his talk. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, as an aside, uh, the project plan. So how do we, how do we build that? So once you have the pain points or the thing, you have to start working on what is the, um, how do we address each issue? What is required? And a lot, and a lot of times it's not usually, again, adding more developers. And one of the interesting things that I, I've noticed that when open source projects, uh, they don't say, they say we need developers, but they never say we need more project planners or we need people who know how to triage uh, or we need, you know, so a lot of time order is what we need more than anything else uh, <laughs> in, in, in the scheme of things. And as, as we went through this, I actually, when we went back on the interaction map or the roles, I put, I put um, project managers or something that's like hotly needed um, because they, they understand how to look at how something is happening and correct, correct things. They, are, they can understand what skill sets are needed, what, uh, what all those things. As a, as a project manager myself, uh, part-time, um, uh, this is sort of, this initially is an evidence of that mentality and so if you're so if you're going back to the document you're 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 saying okay to do this we're going to have to write you, you start off with what are the tasks to other people so uh, going back to the mentors if you say we are repeating the same thing over and over again you're saying well um, that means that um we we need to write documentation. So once you have the documentation, then you go, well, I need to look that up. Now you've already went through the roles and descriptions. So you know, because all those things are laid out for you, you're not sitting and wondering, what do I need? Because that's why you want to go in and document those roles. 
so that you can go back and say, yeah, I need this because documentation is not just documentation in the sense of there's many kinds of documentation. So if you're, if you're trying to document the GNOME project and what it does, then that's one kind. It's not the same as a documentation team who's writing online help or, or the people in engineering who are writing APIs, right? This is cultural description of what we do, how does happen? And or, or on the sense, you, you go to the release team saying, well, those are the people we need to, to write this stuff. So to, now you're able to get, because you did those roles, you can get much more detail over what is required to make, make that happen, right? Uh, and so that's, that's, that's the exciting part. And you, you don't, you don't, you're not thinking, you're, you're not lost in how to do that because you have those things laid out for you. So again, once you do this, you write that. And then you, if you don't have a skills, then you can, you map to the skill set. If you don't have a skill set for that, that means we need to recruit that skill set. So, uh, and so now you know, as an organization, where to put time, effort, money, or any kind of thing, because you know where it leads to, where it fits in, in the overall scheme of things. And one thing I've understand about volunteering uh, and onboarding is that you can always find somebody who would be interested to work on this project. I, there, I, I, in just this initiative alone, I, I started with one person and I've got eight. Uh, I started another initiative um, I started with one and then became three and then it became seven. So people are, and all of them have very different skill sets of whatever it is. It's just in the ask. But once you have the ask, you better know what the context is to get them in through the onboarding uh, uh, cycle, right? So that's something you have to think of. And the, the last part I didn't talk about is how do you measure how do you measure success? So when, when you're going through it, you need to think of what does success look like to me? And, and how do I record that? Because otherwise you'll never know you, that your team grew properly or maybe there's something wrong, maybe you need adjustments. So those are those are things. So but so once you have that plan in 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 place, then you can you you've got your resources in play, you have um, uh, you put your issues in and GitLab or GitHub or whatever it is, and you have some semblance of a plan. Now, I'm not guaranteeing that you're going to get there because it's volunteer, right? Um, and it, that's one of the big things about community projects is volunteers, uh, is, is, uh, not fungible, right? It's, 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 uh, they're there, maybe they're not there like this. And you should be, we should be grateful for whatever work we can get at any time. But if they love the project and they have a great experience and, and things like that, uh, you know, uh, going through this, I think really percolates uh, interesting ideas. So one of the, one of the great things uh, as an aside, uh, we, we figured out was as part of the mentors is we don't have a video that, um, uh, that doesn't, is an onboarding video. I don't know if you've ever, if some of you, this is very US centric and, and I know this is an EU conference, but uh, have you ever been to summer camp and you go there and the, the, the camp counselors, they go through this whole thing, this is camp clackety clack or, or something. And, and they go through this whole spiel about what it is so that you feel like you're part of the the the, uh, the 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 camp, right? In some ways, and I, I realized that we don't have anything like that. And, and and so once we put that in there, I'm like, oh well, if you map that back, I need and I go look for the roles and description. I need a video guy. There it is. There is a video guy. So and then you look at the persona. Well, where would I go? And so so you you see how those things all map out together. Once you have measured and you've got a roadmap of success, you're going to be like, okay, 
we got something, right? And this is where the social engineering part comes in. Once you have a happy set of mentors, they're going to be like, wow, this is a great, a great experience. You're feeling better. So you take that experience and you walk to the next group of people or the next team that might need help. And uh, by that time, hopefully your team is diversified and, and, and you're not burned out going from one of these because it does take a lot of effort to, to plan all these things, right? So then you go on to the next team and then you decide, okay, all right, now what, what do I do now, right? And so that, and, and I, I show them, look, it works. You should do it too. Here it is. Now, each one of them are going to be different in how that plan gets executed because each of them does work differently. Um, you know, working with mentors is going to be very different than working with the engagement marketing team. They're a completely different set of things. What they might feel um, uh, burned out on could be all kinds of things. Gnome as a project that is as, as close to human beings uh, as a whole, normal human beings, not IT tech or anything like that, gets a large share of, of, of noise that could lead to burnout, right? So how, does, how do you deal with burnout when there are individuals or things out there that are constantly giving negative, negative vibes? Right? So that's just an example of of issues or if it's a release team you know they're, they're constantly thinking about what is part of the project sometimes they're in sometimes they're out what is this consistency uh and uh, and other challenges so like again each one of these have different um stories that you have to address but that's one of the great things because no team is like and so uh, when you start again it's a completely you want to say slate clean and you start again so, but uh, so I gave a bunch of exercises and experiences, but a, a lot of things came to light for me, you know, and I do know this process is pretty slow and, um, and it takes time, but if you have a good set of people, they can definitely help and it feels great. And I, giving this talk, I feel excited about doing this and you, if you can see how i'm talking i'm animated right this stuff is amazing i want to do this right so uh so this this is something i care deeply about uh as i do the initiatives that i've done is that uh, putting something that scales and put, and gives you a good onboarding process is is pretty 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 cool um and um, along the way, um, we picked up other folks who uh, we almost had um, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, brain freeze. Uh, uh, but a lot of things like I, there's a lot of things I did not know about Gnome you know, before, and I've been here 22 years. And this process was funny because I, I'll give you one amusing anecdote is. I don't think anybody in this project actually knows how a GNOME release happens. It's magic. And so, so it is magic. And, um, but it's like, like something, something, something that suddenly it just sort of comes together and a release happens. It's, it's, um, it's quite thrilling, but again, there's a lot of things I did not know about. And, uh, when you ask around, like, how does this happen? I don't know. I don't know how it happens. So again, it's magic. So um, the other bits is, uh, I, I, as I was saying previously, we, I modeled this around Chaos Project, which is an amazing project. You should be involved in it. It's awesome. It really, it really laid the foundation down to how to do this initiative. And um, there is a initiative before that I'm working on called the App Ecosystems, where this is actually meta. So I'm, I'm doing with the GNOME project, but that is the entire ecosystem of KDE, GNOME, and other, other com large community projects. And how do we extract data from there so that we can create a dashboard? Just, it's, it's the same kind of thing. 
Um, the other parts was uh, I invited as part of research, I invited a lot of external people from Red Hat uh, and other places that uh, um, was, um, that was, uh, that not only were, we were able to talk about things like, what was your onboarding process like? Uh, we had people, folks from OpenStack come in, we had some folks from Red Hat, they talked to us about um, various other things. So um, so just, just just turned a little bit like a, a lecture series. So it was it was really, really quite great. And of course the revelations we worked in scalable mentors was fantastic. Uh, I was really excited about the feedback and I'm like, how do we fix this? You know, this is great stuff. So uh, I'm I'm really into key learnings and and again, I love to repeat myself. Uh, so if you do do this, um, uh, feel free to talk to me. Uh, it gives you, again, the, this process gives you a lot of insight. Um, there's a lot of context about how you understand and understand the issues and things like that. And each thing is different. So what works for us may not work for you and, and so forth. So, um, if you want to, if you want to come around with us, um, I'm happy to share the, the work we did with the documentation, the overall project plan we did. Uh, we have recorded meetings, some of the meetings that we did with OpenStack and Red Hat uh, um, are all are all uh, recorded. So if you want to see some of them, you could do that. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So um, that's the end of my talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening to me virtually. Uh, yeah, I certainly enjoyed talking to all of you about this. Again, I'm super, super excited about this thing. It's, it's really awesome. And I hope to come back in about a year and give an update on uh, how things worked out. If it worked out the way I expected to, if it did not, you know, there it's, uh, it'll be, it'll be, It'll be interesting. So uh, if you want to contact me, you can reach me at my email. I'm sure you can have org or my personal address, sure at rampushna.me. You can follow me on Twitter, although that's mostly politics. I don't know if you want that kind of thing, but uh, feel free for you to follow me. Uh, I, I, I forgot to put in my Dev2, but uh, I do have a Dev2 where I, I do focus on uh, technical topics. So um, Anyway, I think I'd like to thank the Linux Foundation for, for um, being a part of this. And uh, thanks again. And uh, I will be staking, staying, um, uh, I'll be here online. So if um, this, this is a recorded talk, uh, I'll be around to take questions uh, and uh, be happy to answer anything you might have. I have a, a wide set of things I do. So thanks again.